Yep, it is that time again. Welcome to Unstoppable Mindset. I'm Michael Hinkson, your host. Glad to be here. Hope you are happy to be here. Probably are because you're here, right? So wherever you are, welcome. And we really appreciate you and hope that you enjoy the next hour. We have a fascinating guest. Um, We're actually starting the recording of this podcast 10 minutes late because we've just been sitting here chatting. Champa Bakshi is a woman very involved in tech. She has formed a company called Converge Hub, and she um, and and actually Converge Hub is a software, well, not a software product specifically, but it is a customer resource management tool. Um, and she'll tell us about that. So I don't want to mess up my description more than I have. But she's also formed a company called CoreLinks, which is a system by which she helps other customers write software and do things that they need to do to make their company work the way it should. And um, she has a great amount of experience in the world of computer science. She's been involved in Silicon Valley tech for a while. She has a master's degree in computer science. We're jealous. And uh, lots of other things. So Shampa, welcome to Unstoppable Mindset after all of that. Hello, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. And you notice that I didn't use Queen of the World, which I said I could use. And Yes. And thank you for that, too. You're safe. Well, I really am fascinated to learn. Let's start with more about you and what you did growing up and how you got to the point of being so interested and involved in tech. Yeah, of course. I... Um, actually started uh, software programming in college and like well initially I always had an interest in science and my initial interest I wanted to go into nuclear physics so physics was my first love and then good I subject got, yeah, uh, and then uh, my, my master's degree is in physics Oh, wow. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. So I have a bachelor's in physics, and then I went on to do a master's in computer science. So wonderful. Yeah, it, it's a really great subject. It's fascinating. That's fair. Yeah. And, but then, you know, when I you know, went, I just started taking some uh, computer courses. And once I wrote my first software program, I was totally hooked. And The main reason I really liked it is because it gave me this ability to take a complex problem and then kind of, you know, break it down into little bits and then solve it and kind of, you know, put the solution back together again. So I really, really was uh, interested in that. And then, you know, that was a time when computers as a career, it was just opening up. It was just beginning. And I wasn't thinking so much as a career itself, but more in terms of it it was really because in that time, when you go into a career, most of the time you could only influence a certain amount of people, right? You know, only the people around you. But what I realized is using computers, you could build a program with somebody sitting on the other corner of the world used to solve his problem, which you probably won't even think about. And just that idea of being able to touch people whom you don't even know, you know, whom you haven't heard of. It was so fascinating to me that I had to get into that and I had really to do it. So, so, and even today, even though I don't write software code anymore, but just that idea of building software products, which people all over the world use to solve their problems. It's, it's really interesting to me. I feel like I'm touching their lives. There you go. Well, what do you do specifically today? Well, today I'm the CEO of Converge Hub, so I'm a jack of all trades, really, in the company. So I'm handling the the product development. I do oversee that. I do some marketing and even the other financial stuff that I have to do on a daily basis. So that boring I, stuff. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but very necessary. Yes. Yeah. It is part of what has to be done, and uh, at least. You, well, I don't know whether you have the patience or not, but you certainly seem to be able to, to put up with it all. Not always, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I try. Does, does your coding experience 
help you in doing all the other things that that you have to do in the company? Um, or maybe a better question would be, how does that past experience help you? That's actually very interesting. Now that I think about it, it it, it really does. Because when you are coding, you are taught to kind of look at a problem, I kind of you know, step away from it and just look at it as a problem and then start breaking it down or tinkering with it. You know that as a challenge itself, you cannot solve the whole thing. But when you break it down and you address it one by one, you are able to solve it. And you, without really getting too involved with, that, with taking a step back. So if you take that approach to any other you know, work that you have to do, any other experience or challenge that you're going through, I think that really helps you, uh, you know, solve it in a better way. Yeah, that's that's kind of what uh, I was thinking that you would say. I remember when I was in undergraduate physics, and of course it it then followed on. But in undergraduate physics, oftentimes professors would say, "Pay attention to the details. It's all about the details. It isn't just the math, for example. It's the units." And if the units don't work out, right, then you probably are doing something wrong. So you really need to look at the details. And I've always felt that that background in physics, even though I am not doing anything specifically in physics, the background has helped a great deal for me in everything that I do, because I've learned to pay attention to a lot of the details and appreciate the value in doing that. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's what it is. And I had I had read somewhere that you know education is you know what survives after what you learned has been forgotten. So I guess that's what it is. It kind of you know builds into you, and then you know you keep using it in other experiences in your life. Yeah, I've talked to a number of people on this podcast who say the reoccurring theme is you should never stop learning. Absolutely, I totally agree about that. Yeah, it's it's kind of one of those things that that one needs to do. Well, you went off and you, where'd you get your master's from, by the way? Oh, I did my master's from India. Okay. Yeah. And, and then you, you, then you came over here at some point yes. and, um, and you, you started working now. Did you code when you first came over or how did, what brought you over here? Yeah. So in India, after I uh, you know, did my master's, I started working in a company and that company was then you know, deploying uh, some, uh, you know, software programmers here. So I came as a part of that and I literally <laughs> landed in US with what, you know, less than a, what, $150 or so and uh, a job, of course, and went from there. So, you know, after I worked, uh, initially I started working with the f- large enterprises like uh, Cisco Systems, um, Pyramid Technologies, which was a part of Siemens, and uh, I, yes, I was doing programming in Cisco Systems. I was part of the the sales, the customer facing side of the software, really. You know, the sales, customer service. And in those days, there was no such thing as customer relationship management software. It didn't even mm-hmm. exist. So what we were doing is we were taking uh, Oracle applications, the ERP package, and we were customizing it to build those pieces in and. Cisco eventually, you know, it it came, uh, it became the first company who um, did the online ordering, the entire online ordering, where an order from a customer would go in and to be fulfilled without uh, the touch of a human hand. So, and this was very, very early days, and I was really fortunate to be a part of that big whole uh, team. What, what kind of what time frame was that? So this was. Um, Kind of mid to late 90s, actually, okay. so late 90s, Great. yeah, 98, 99 kind of uh, time frame. Yeah. So, and uh, then uh, after that, I started working on a few startups, but then always wanted to open my um, own company. So that's when I launched CoreLinks. And well, in, as a part of CoreLinks, what we do is we build custom software. We are a software strategy firm, so we provide, uh, you know, like a fractional CTO services, strategy services, uh, software development for both products as well as uh, software applications. So, and it, we did that. And even while we were doing that, kind of note, notice that a lot of the requests that we were getting for building the software, 
centered around the same thing about uh, you know, customer relationship management. How do I handle my customers? You know, how do I support my customers? How do I do lead management? So we were building, uh, constantly we were building software for that for all our clients. And it began to occur to me, you know, I started digging in and found out that really, you know, there was no product in the market which suffice that need for customers. There were really two types of uh, customer relationship products in the market at that time. Um, one was really huge, big, uh, large scale software. You need a PhD to implement that. And other than that, there was these you know, small little contact management systems, really, you know, dumbed down products, which really didn't suffice the need of, uh, you know, small and medium businesses because they had their complex processes but at the same time, they couldn't spend that kind of money, you know, to, to implement such a large scale software. So that's why we decided to build Converge Hub, which uh, would, uh, you know, service these kind of customers. And uh, yeah, so we, we started building Converge Hub, and, uh, which is right now a cust complete customer lifecycle management system. It's uh, right from the beginning of the customer journey till the end is supported within Converge Hub. So is it is it a web-based system then? or Yes, it is a SaaS product, software as a service product. And right. yes, it's completely online. Cool. How does it, well, so now we have other things like Salesforce and so on. How does it compare with those kinds of products, which of course didn't exist back in the early days? Yes. No. When I was working in those, uh, you know, Cisco and those other large um, enterprises, uh, Salesforce didn't exist. By the time I had, you know, founded Converge Hub, Salesforce, you know, did start up. But Salesforce was in that category of a large scale software, which needs a lot of effort to implement, which small right. businesses didn't necessarily have. So, yeah. So Converge Hub is kind of is in the same space, does similar things, but in a much more simpler way so that you can get that, you are able to, uh, you know, establish, you are able to serve your complex business processes, but you really didn't have to put in so much effort to implement them. The implementation is much simpler. I remember when selling tape backup products for Quantum Corporation and others before it and so on, working with Wall Street, of course, they used both Oracle and Sybase, and Sybase was very unformatted fields and so on. Right. But those firms essentially created their own software within those database structures to do the same kind of work in terms of managing customers, managing orders, managing all of the things related to that. And the Security Exchange Commission required it, of course, of Wall Street because they needed you to have a way where you track all your orders, which Wall Street firms would want to do anyway, and then to keep them for seven years off site. So we provided the tape backup products and they would work with products like Elgato and other kinds of uh, tools that would communicate between their systems and the backup products that we provided. So a lot of moving parts. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And yeah, it's come a long way since then, but it's always fun to think back to how quickly we have changed how much. Yeah, as I was saying to somebody not too long ago, I remember when a disk crash was a real disk crash. Yes. <laughs> where you had a 16-inch platter and the head was micro centimeters above it. And, and if it fell, it was a very noisy situation and all your data was lost. Uh, was pretty amazing. So we've come a long way and, and we'll continue to. That's what kind of makes this technology era fun. Exactly. On, on the other hand, um, even with you starting in India and so on, tell me a little bit about how women were viewed in tech. And, and I would think that you were kind of a breakthrough person to deal with some of that. Yeah, actually, when I started um, in college, when I went into software, we didn't have that many, you know, women in uh, technology at that time. But uh, it's not like I faced a lot of resistance to it, but there just weren't that many. Software was a very new subject at the yeah. time. And but then I was so fascinated with it, I wasn't really looking at the gender, I just wanted to build software. So I wasn't really looking at you know, how many, you know, how easy or hard it would be for me to 
get in. Right. Or, you know. But yeah, since then, even after coming, you'd be surprised though, even after coming into Silicon Valley, I did face some challenges uh, there. It's not so much as, I don't think people really resist you because, uh, you know, you're a woman. It's not that people say that, okay, you know, she's a woman. I'm not going to you know, listen to what, it, uh, what she does. I'm not going to you know, give credit or and I'm going to cause resistance. Not really, but it's more sort of a mindset. You, there's this assumption kind of a thing uh, that you probably aren't as good. You know, you probably won't be able to do it. And then, you know, you have to keep proving yourself all the time so and then you know it's when you prove yourself it's not that people won't accept it you know people do so i would think it's more a matter of just education and getting used to it rather than uh, yeah actively uh, you know making sure you know, women don't get a chance but i think that's true of people who are are different than what is viewed as the norm in general i mean in terms of blindness for example uh, there's there's resistance, uh, and the general assumption is that if you're blind, you can't succeed nearly as well as sighted people can, uh, and that that view has been around for a while. It does take a lot of educating, uh, and you do have to continuously prove yourself to be able to accomplish tasks and and grow in the industry. It isn't that you can't, but it certainly tends to be harder because, as you said, it's the mindset of what people believe you can and can't do. And unfortunately, in the case of, well, and, and in some ways with women too, but in the case of blind people, for example, the unemployment rate among employable blind people is still in the area around 70%. And it's not because people who are blind, um, who happen to be blind can't work. It's that others think they can't work and that prejudice still exists. Oh, I, I totally you know, get that. And, you know, I, interestingly, I had had an encounter which um, this was this was a while ago. I was in college at the time and I was kind of, you know, I, I think I had gone down for some internship returning home. Know, got down from the bus and there was this you know, blind person who had traveled with us who also kind of you know, got down from the bus and there was this road to cross. And he was um, looking around and he asked for help. He said, can somebody please help me cross the road? And th the bus was full of people. So, so many people had uh, you know, uh, unboarded the bus, but it was kind of really strange that although he was asking and he was asking confidently, but nobody, it's, people were hearing it. Obviously, they were hearing it. They were sort of pretending not to hear it and mm. you know, going their own way. And it took me by surprise, not just the people's reaction, but even that person's reaction, because he was very confident. He was not, uh, yeah, he, there was no kind of, uh, he was not submissive. He was not even, you know, if, although he was asking for help, he was doing it so confidently. I thought it was the, other side, the people who should have been more confident probably were not confident. They didn't even have the confidence to step forward and just help him cross the road. So I watched that for a little while and then I decided to step up. So I went to him, I said, okay, come on. I took his hand and I just helped him cross the road. I, I, want, I asked if you know, he wanted help just getting home. And he said, oh no, I live close by. I can manage from here. I just needed help crossing the road. And he, he just went about his way confidently. You couldn't even tell that he was blind unless you, know, you actually looked at his stick. So that yeah. experience really stayed with me that really, you know, this person was so confident. Why was it all he needed was a little bit of help. You know, why wouldn't you know, anybody do that? Of course, the other thing that would be helpful is he could figure out how to cross the road. I mean, I used to live in Winthrop, Massachusetts, and every day, both going to the bus and getting off the bus coming home, we had a bus stop that was across the road from the entrance to my apartment complex. And it was just in the middle of the road, right? So there wasn't like a, a, a major street that the bus stopped at. There was a bus stop and it was right in the middle of the street. Mm -hmm. And um, there are tools to use. It, it was a little bit daunting until I figured out that, hey, one thing I can do to cross the road is to follow other people and listen to them as they are crossing. 
And the other is to wait until the bus leaves so it's quieter and then listen to traffic. And when I don't hear traffic coming across in front of me for at least a little bit of period of time and I don't hear anything that sounds like it's close, then to go across the road. But it it, it is a it is a process. Um and it can be it can well I, it can be scary, but it can be daunting if you really don't learn to, you know, to do that. So I'm, I'm a little bit curious why he had some issues with being able to cross the road and perhaps he didn't have enough hearing to be able to do that. Who knows? Oh, um, actually, I think I know it's probably because this was in India yeah. and it's so loud and so noisy and so much and, traffic going yeah, all the time. And, and there was no, no lull in the noise. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So that was very, very chaotic and very, very noisy the entire time. So he couldn't use noise as a as a marker. He couldn't use cross. noise as a yeah. yeah. So the only thing he could possibly do if he could hear it is to just listen to other people, and as they're going across, stay right behind them. But still, it's an issue. Did he use a cane or anything like that? Yeah, he used a cane. I yeah, good, that. good. That because that would would certainly help. But you know, everyone is different, and certainly the noise factor is a big issue. I've been in New York on street corners where there are well-defined crosswalks and well-defined ways to go, but it's so noisy that it's even hard to hear the traffic going the way I want to go. And, you know, what we do is we listen, and when the traffic is going the way we want to go, then we cross. But sometimes the noise can be so loud around us that even that's hard to hear. Yes. So, there are always challenges, yeah. but it doesn't mean that we can. And that's part of the problem is that sometimes people would go, well, you just could never do that because you're yeah. blind. Well, I can, but um, you know, let's, let's talk about the sun being in your eyes and how well you're able to see when the sun's coming right at you. <laughs> you know, we all have challenges. Yes, of course. So good for you for helping. <laughs> oh, sure. Thank you. <laughs> but, it, but it is an issue and it is a, a challenge that we have. Well, so you went off and you got your your master's degree in computer science and you came over to the U.S. That must have been maybe the, the way I would put it is quite an adventure, huh? Just getting here and all. Oh, yes, that it was. Totally new for you. Yes, it was absolutely new for me. And then, yeah, getting into a tech industry, an immigrant, brown woman, you know, starting to work in the tech industry. It wasn't easy, but then... Yeah, you learn as you go. It was, you know, there are challenges, you know, you start uh, looking at, um, yeah, and then there, there are there are challenges and then there are solutions. You know, it's, uh, you know, people do help out. And it's just, if I think a, a lot of it is also about how much you like the subject and how hard you're willing to work. And if you have that, I think all other challenges, you know, you're, you'll probably be able to work out. But you had a mindset that, you were going to work it out. You were going to try to do that as opposed to letting it all overwhelm you. Oh yeah, absolutely. That's, I think it's also a little bit about being able to know that, yes, you will be able to do it. You know, ultimately it's going to work out. It, maybe you can just try to look a little bit into the future and say, you know, here I am going to do it. This is just a process, you know, just a few challenges, which I will have to go through. Everybody has their own challenges. These are mine. Yeah. And that's the real point, isn't it? Everyone has their own challenges and exactly. and challenges aren't the same for everyone. Absolutely. Yeah. Totally agree. So you, you made it over, you started and you started doing, um, doing technology stuff and, and all that. So how, how long was it before you started working essentially for yourself? Uh, I started working for myself around, let's say, 2002, 2003, I think, time frame. Uh-huh. So that's when I started kind of consulting, you know, going solo, started working uh, on smaller size project. And a year or so after that, I launched uh, CoreLinks. So that's when, uh, yeah, so slowly that grew, you know, we started getting more projects and then uh, I started having a team, uh, you know, we formed a team in India too. So, and I started off loading some of my work to them and slowly the team grew and yeah. So that's how, how, how things took off. 
what were some of the early projects like that you started and um, that you used Coralinks to develop? Oh, we were always working. In the beginning, we were mostly working on software applications or uh, so, yeah, one of uh, uh, interesting one was in the insurance industry. I remember this was this was way back, but you know we were kind of you know comparing different uh, insurance products, and you know this was for car insurance, if I remember correctly, and 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 it was really advanced for its time too. And we were kind of you know giving there were some hundreds of points on which you know you could compare insurances. So usually when you're reading at insurance, you don't even know, you don't even look at the fine print. And this was a kind of a technology where which would help you uh, compare insurance uh, without really having to look at the fine print. So, so this that that was one. There was another one for the fintech industry that we were building the entire end-to-end process uh, for fintech. So, yeah, some some very interesting uh, projects we did in the beginning. What kind of uh, language or, or coding did you use to develop those? At that time, uh, we were using uh, PHP and we used MySQL um, as a database. Yeah, the SQL servers and all that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> what do you use now? How's it evolved over the years? Yeah, now, although I'm not coding anymore, but uh, my team uses. But your team, like, yes. <laughs> yeah. Uses uh, Node. We use um, yeah, Angular. So, uh, yeah, there's MongoDB we use. So a lot, it's changed significantly. Even the way you code has signif- and changed significantly. It's a lot more uh, modular. And at that time, we used to write, you know, thousands of line of codes, a lot of very, very uh, monolithic kind of code. Now it's so much more modular. It's uh, distributed. So things have changed completely. But it's kind of fun to watch my team. Although, you know, yeah, I don't get that involved into the day-to-day process anymore. You you have enough and you keep up with it. So you could, if you needed to be involved in the process, I would assume. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I still have my, you know, kind of, you know, hand in there. I have daily meetings with the team. But right now, my perspective is more from that of a user, from that of a you know, customer, how the customer experience, what will a user go through. So that's my perspective rather than, wow, this is cool. You know, this is a nice bit of technology. Let's use it. I don't think of think of it like that anymore. But it's good to be able to take the user perspective. Um, and it's good to have that in a company because then you you really get to understand it from the standpoint of those who are going to be directly involved with and encounter your products as opposed to just creating them and pushing them out the door without having that understanding, I would think. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And that's somehow you mature because in the beginning, that's how you kind of, you know, especially from, from a tech background, you kind of, you know, think, you know, tech is cool. And uh, yeah, so just try to use anything. And I, I see my team still trying to do that. I, I, I have to push back on it just because it's the user who is the most important person here. And, you know, whatever that takes, you know, technology is cool as long as it's serving the customer. And really, I, I would say, you know, we are we are coming up with a new release of Converge Hub, and what we are trying to do here, you know, I'm I'm really trying to put in the human perspective into it more than anything else, because from my experience in the software industry from a very long time, what I'm seeing is there is really no B two B or B two C or you know anything like that anymore. It's really a matter of. Uh, a human being using your product. It's a person using your product, you know, whatever else, you know, from whomever to whomever, it's still ultimately a person using it. So that kind of knowledge really comes with experience. And that's what, how we are building Converge Hub. So our idea is that using Converge Hub, you know, sales and marketing and customer service, all that is wonderful. And our users will be doing all of that. The features are there, but more so what we would like our user to do is to be able to use the product to you know, make a difference. So you know, he is able to make a difference right where he is at. You know, whatever he or she is doing, he should be able to do it better, do it in such a way that you know, maybe do it quicker and do it to build you know, better businesses and I hope better communities, ultimately. One would hope. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so when did you, if you will, graduate from CoreLinks and so on to Converge Hub? Although you do both, but when did when did Converge Hub first come into existence? 
Uh, Converge Hub's release was, the first release was somewhere around, I think we started getting customers around 2017 or so, although it was released a little bit earlier in the market, around 2015, 2016, but that's when we were, it was the very first release, we started ironing out all the bugs. I'm a bit of a perfectionist, so I didn't really want to push and sell the product until the bugs were ironing out, the, all the features were built in. So then we started you know, getting customers in the 2016, 2017 time frame, and it went from there. And uh, now we are getting into the next release, the next version of Converge Hub. I will bet, however, that no matter how much you did to perfect it and iron out all the bugs, that once you actually released it, your users started finding things that you guys didn't discover. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you would bet correctly. <laughs> <laughs> you would win that bet. <laughs> so yes, there were, and I think software is basically a work in progress. You know, you can never have a hundred percent perfect software. By the time you have the bugs ironed out, there are more features you're building it, and those new features will have some bugs. It's always work in progress. No, no company, no software ever built has hundred uh, percent everything, all bugs ironed out. But you try, and what you do really hope is that the the bugs that you do still have aren't hampering the main activities of your users. So if it's you know really hampering their productivity, if it's not letting them do what they would like to do in the software, that's that's when it uh, uh, like takes priority. And that's how we prioritize bugs too. You know which ones to fix first, which ones to kind of put on the back burner. You're now you're in California, right? You're in the Silicon Valley. Yes. So you watch some of the same TV commercials that I do if you watch TV at all. And actually, I saw it again this morning. Um, there is someone who has been putting out some commercials that are just slamming Tesla because they say that the autonomous vehicle software in Tesla is dangerous and Congress should stop it and so on. And he's made that his primary focus in his Senate campaign. It's, it's fascinating, not Withstanding the fact that Tesla hasn't, as I understand it, at least the last time I checked, released a totally autonomous vehicle version of the software. But the reality is it's always going to be a work in progress to do what Tesla has already done so much of to make their vehicle um, work in, in a way to greatly assist drivers. And it's just fascinating to see that kind of a mindset that just wants to put a stop to all of that kind of stuff when that makes no sense at all. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I totally agree with you there because if it's a software, there's always going to be bugs. So that's for sure. But it is true that in certain industries, those bugs have a bigger impact. Correct. Because if you are not careful, you know, when you're driving a car, a bug could, you know, injure somebody you know, uh, or worse. But um, at the same time, you know, similar to that is medical profession. You know, so anything, any software in the medical profession, you have to test very, very thoroughly because there are human lives involved. Uh, but at the same time, at some point, you, know, you have to do your best and you have to completely test thoroughly. And I think incrementally, you do have to release the software. Otherwise, it just doesn't happen, right? So, and knowing that it is software and there will be bugs and we just do our level best to make sure that that bug doesn't have the worst kind of impact. Well, being an equal opportunity abuser, of course, my immediate reaction is if we're going to talk about what goes on with Tesla, let's talk about people driving in general and there's yes. some value <laughs> in replacing them. Exactly. Um, you know, the I, I don't know. My, I'm amazed at my wife. Now, my wife uses a wheelchair. She uses hand controls and she drives really well. Mm -hmm. We have had one accident in the almost 40 years that we, well, we've had a couple, but there was one accident that we were probably more responsible for than um, anything else. We had one where we were actually going to anniversary dinner and we came over a hill and there was a place where a car should not have been stopped on the road and there was no way to see it ahead of time. But this young lady who was a, a teenage driver had just stopped in the middle of the road and we we bumped her before we could stop. So it, mm -hmm. it was a brand new car and a dent in the car. Um, but we had a time where we were driving and actually 
um, we a, a gust of wind kind of blew us over and we brushed against um, a piece of heavy equipment and then went back across the road. But partly she was also trying to avoid a trailer that had come up on us. Um, oh. We had, we had, she saw the truck that was pulling the trailer, but didn't see the trailer. It was in her blind spot. Well, anyway, um, but she, but she dealt with it, but there are so many people on the road that are so impatient, drive so aggressively. Um, and I don't know how they survive because they, they don't do anything to recognize the courtesy and the, what we used to call in the world defensive driving. You know, we don't do that anymore. No. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm all for taking the, the driving away from drivers and, and as soon as we can, putting it into a, a much more autonomous vehicle kind of environment because too many crazy people are out there driving on the road. Yeah. And I think you're absolutely right. So when once, you know, we get into that autonomous driving becomes the main thing. You know what? You know what I hear. What the what kind of uh, the research says uh, that they are way safer than just these crazy people or drunk people. You know, driving a car at least the machine won't do drunk drunk driving. You know, we are kind of in the forefront of it, and we're new into it. But it's going to happen. It has to. Yes, absolutely, it has to and, happen. And, so in in so there's a lot of artificial intelligence and machine learning that goes into all that. And speaking of that, how does that play into both you and Converge Hub and CoreLinks and so on? Do you use much artificial intelligence to help in the development or testing of your software and so on? Um, yes, and it's not so much in the development itself, but we are uh, planning in the new version of Converge Hub. We are, you know, planning to put, uh, you know, artificial intelligence in there. You know, there's AI to do a lot of automated stuff, which initially would have to be manual. And then, of course, you know, there is, uh, you know, so much data, data analytics, and all of that is going to be built into uh, the new uh, version of um, yeah, of Converge Hub. So. All the definite features are not ironed out yet, you know, what we are going to give, but there's you no know, one thing for sure is that we are going to have a completely channel-less uh, conversations. So regardless of, you know, like, like today's users, they could be using, you know, one channel at one point of time and, you know, completely switch channels, you know, the other point of time. So, you know, from email to phone, to Twitter, to, uh, you know, to uh, texting. So all of these uh, channels should appear as if it's still a conversation, as if it's a one conversation thread going right. on the whole time. So that's, and there is so much insights that you can figure out from those conversations. And, you know, many other companies have started working in it on it. It's not perfect. Nobody has perfected it, but, you know, we are definitely, you know, going to work on that and see, you know, where that leads us. Uh, so for me as a tech person, it's, like both ways, you know, one is, of course, you know, this is the latest technology. This is where we are going to be. We have to be there. But the change, the more they remain the same, you know. So it's ultimately it's about how the technology will help you do a better job, you know, at whatever it is that you're doing. So as long as we can do that, we balance that, you know, that that's the ideal way to go, I would say. Again, we're in a bleeding age environment where so many of these things are new. And we're just learning about them. And then in a hundred years, it's going to be a totally different world. And then we'll have other things that are new. But, yes. but what we're talking about today as kind of in the formative era will all change. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and the change is coming faster and faster. You know, it's, it's exciting to see a little bit scary too, but as time goes by, it's just, it's uh, the, the pace is accelerating. You know, you don't even know, I mean, why hundred years? We don't really even know what's coming up in the next five or 10 years from now. So right. that's exciting and scary at the same time. Sometime in the next hundred years, somebody's going to probably develop anti-gravity and maybe we'll even get Star Trek transporters. Yes. You know, I, I'm just waiting for that, you know, <laughs> beat me up, Scotty. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm waiting for that. Would, that would certainly take care of a lot of the driving issues, yes, wouldn't it? Yes, that's going to take care of it. Absolutely. No more driving. I'd love that. Oh, yeah. Well, we could use the roads for other things. Robert Heinlein wrote a, a short story called The Roads Must Roll back in the early 1950s. And instead of driving, roads all moved um, and were long, almost like conveyor belts, even going from one end of California to the other. 
Um, it was a it was a fascinating story. It's a it's a really interesting story to read because oh. everyone used rolling roads to go anywhere and off of the main roads. There were other roles that took you roads that rolled that took you where you needed to go. Um, it's a fascinating story. Yeah, wow, that's an interesting concept. You know, <laughs> so cars don't need to drive; it's the roads that are doing the driving for you. Right. Yeah, go hunt it. It's called The Roads Must Roll by Robert Heinlein. I'll definitely look at it. Yes. It's a short story. You can read it in 15 minutes. Oh, uh, sure. Yeah, so, I'm so. going to look it up. Yep. yep. Yeah, there the you other go. Day I was reading about another fascinating concept too somewhere is that, you know, cars start uh, charging themselves as they drive. So, you know, you have some sort of, you know, I don't even know if there's a real uh, roads are going to be built such that in you know, the cars while they're driving, they get charged. So you really don't need to charge the cars anymore. I think... Well, I know um, somewhere in this area around San Diego, I think it is, there was a road that had uh, some sort of cable going through it that helped provide guidance for the car. But I don't remember whether it charged or not. I think it was pre a lot of the electric vehicles, but I wouldn't be surprised if there wouldn't be a way coming along that cars could charge themselves. Of course, there's always solar, but uh, you probably need more than what we can do with solar today on a small car. Right, exactly. So, yeah, I would say the technology problem, getting it out into the world in a more cost-effective way, building the infrastructure, that would be you know, the challenging part. But that's going to be a lot of what happens with software is it's all about making it more efficient, making it cost-efficient, and getting things out in an efficient way, isn't it? Yes, yes. That that's ends on... Uh, yeah, how, how cost effective we can make it. And in core links, when our clients come in, that's what we tell them too. You know, we can do it very fast. We can, you can build a huge, uh, I don't know, airplane for you, but do you really need that? And how much budget do you have? So we have to build according to your needs and your budget. We do our best work, you know, otherwise everything is possible. You, you talk a lot, both about Converge Hub and core links about efficiency and the the importance of that and and what you do and what you're bringing to your customers. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think um, uh, efficiency is uh, especially you know both in Converge Hub and Core Links, although you know in different ways. But for Converge Hub, it's a matter of uh, I would say productivity. So it's it's how it's not just about what you can do. It's I would say it's a matter of how well you can do it, how quickly you can do it, and what results you can get you know, doing it. You know, that's what uh, I would say you know, makes the software special. Otherwise, it's not about building a lot of features, a lot of you know, wonderful tools that nobody uses. Where do you see, we talked about artificial intelligence, but where do you see that and what other kinds of things do you see coming along in the next five or 10 years that you can look at and talk about in terms of how some of the ways we think of software and some of the ways software will interact with our lives are going? Yeah, that's that's a, an interesting question. I would say software slowly will stop becoming something that you're kind of you know, sitting at your desk or even you know, looking at it on the mobile phone. It's going to become everywhere. It, it's everything is going to be software. So your, your, I mean, and right now we do have that, you know, your, your TV has software, your fridge has software, but it's just going to become such that, and especially, you know, you are going to be able to like, you know, talk to it and we do it again, you know, it's all there right now, but it's going to become ubiquitous. It's going to be, you know, your car, your home, your, uh, your washing machine, and every single thing that you do is going to become software. It's, you, we won't call it software anymore. I think you'll just call it life. So it's just there. And so, and in terms of technology, if you will, I think voice as a technology, voice activation, talking to your machines, you know, that's going to become, you know, more and more, uh, yeah, important. The insights that it gives you in terms of, you know, sales software or you know, customer software that we're looking at. Even now in next Converge Hub, that's our aim to uh, you know bring about is that looking at your past data or whatever work that you're doing, it's telling you a future direction. And again, that it, that efficiency that you talk about, the productivity you talk about. So there are these 100, 200 things that you could do today, but which 10 that you do will 
bring an impact? Which 10 of those should you focus on to get the maximum impact, the maximum out of your day? So that those kind of insights are going to become important. You know, right now, again, you know, everybody is trying to do it. I won't say, you know, we are where we, you know, at where we should be, but we are getting there. And those are the kind of things that I foresee, you know, happening. Other than the fact that, you know, we are going to probably have humanoid kind of, you know, robots whom we are going to interact with. And yeah, who knows? <laughs> so yeah. those are all in the horizon coming up soon. Of course, you have Ray Kurzweil, who talks about the singularity, the time when uh, computers, if you will, and humans um, merge, and we, through our brains, can access all of it directly. Yes, uh, the the thought interface, you know, that we sometimes we talk about, and yeah, th- those are I don't know, it's exciting and scary at the same time, right? Just something we can't even think about, but it's slowly creeping upon us. It's happening so slowly, probably, that we are not even noticing, but we are getting there, and we just have to figure out ways and probably even laws to deal with it. Well, and that's going to be part of it is is the laws and trying to definitely put a standard to it. Do yes. you but I but I it seems to me, and I mentioned the the senator campaign and so on, it strikes me that, those kinds of of commercials and that kind of a discussion really represents a fear of change and a fear of what these products are really bringing to us, which shouldn't be there, but it still is. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would totally agree on that. I think it's more about the fear of the unknown in another form. So you don't really you know, know where this is going, which is true. I mean, it, it's scary. But at the same time, you cannot ignore the enormous amount of value it is adding to our lives. So I would say that the way to you know, get through this is to you know, not really ignore it and not to shy away from it and say, hey, you know, Tesla software is buggy, so we never go autonomous uh, you know, driving way. But um, to kind of um, look at it right now and say, what standards should we set? What laws should we set? What is it that we need to do? to make sure all of this works out well for us. It doesn't end in disaster. It, it works out such that, you know, rather than, uh, you know, being seen as a flaw, it, it's seen as something that saves lives because autonomous driving ultimately will save lives if done right. How do we get people to go from where they are to recognizing um, what you just said, which is the value of a lot of these kinds of improvements? It seems like it's an ongoing battle, but how do we get people to move past no to yes, if you will? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I would say the only way to do it is with education, right? So it's always the fear of unknown and education is what's going to make that unknown known to you. So the more we can educate people, the more we kind of bring it a little more to the masses and say that, you know, you bring it such that we can, you know, touch and feel it and see there's really nothing to be afraid of. Um, I think the more it works. Um, I remember when I was in Cisco, I had, they had this big lab where they were testing out all these different things. And this was very, very, you know, initial days of, but I remember they were testing out things like uh, technology, like you could order, uh, milk, you could ask your refrigerator to order milk for you. Or, mm-hmm. you know, you could turn on the oven while you're driving home uh, in your car, you could uh, switch on uh, your oven. At that time, that seemed like, oh my goodness, you know, what if my house burns down? Now it doesn't seem so absurd anymore. So it's just a matter of education, how much we have accepted it. And it's a matter of time and education. I think it's a factor of both of them. Yeah. And how we can get people educated more quickly exactly. to be more adventurous. And that's what it really is, right? You you came over from India um, into a pretty unknown situation. And I've experienced some of those things in my life going from one side of the country to the other with no family and no support system and developing a whole new thing. But life is an adventure. And all too often we don't we don't think about the fact that it's an adventure and a great learning experience. And if we could get more people to view it that way, we probably would also have a lot less fear 
or at least we would be open to exploring new things, even though the fear might be there. Again, it would be something that we can start to work to control. Yeah, I would I would totally agree with that because there is always risk. I mean, even in life, I mean, you don't know. You go out of the home, there is risk. You know, there is always a risk you're facing. But how do you? Uh, it's just that somehow you know people think there is more risk in the unknown. But you know, maybe the rewards are greater in the unknown too. You just don't know that. You just have to take that risk to find out what it is all about. And to me, again, I think that's a lot about, I call that the entrepreneurial mindset. And I've recently started talking about this too, because I think the entrepreneurial mindset has that, that thing to, you know, that spark where you can step up, you can take a little bit of risk, you can look at any challenges and say that, yeah, I'm going to solve this. It's not just about entrepreneurs. It's not that it's just in entrepreneurs. I think it's in it, regardless of what life situation is in, whether you're in a business or whether you have are going solo or not, you know, whatever it is that you are doing right now, you can bring that mindset into it and you know, experiment a little bit, you know, step up into it, take a little bit of risk, you know, learn a little bit more. And that would, I think, would help uh, you know, life become a lot more interesting. Well, tell me more about that. You you are an entrepreneur, obviously, by kind of any standard, but Tell me more about your your thoughts about being an entrepreneur. How do we get more people to do that? How do we get more people to accept that they can possibly do the same sort of thing? Yes, sure. Yes, I have uh, you know always been an entrepreneur. I think because uh, yeah, I come from a family of entrepreneurs, and I've always wanted to have my own company, and so at. It's to me, it's more so because I love to build things, you know, whether it's a product, whether it's a company. I like to kind of, you know, see the little bits coming together to form a whole and then impacting, getting bigger than yourself. It, it becomes, you know, initially when you're looking at it, you know, it's a vision, it's completely within you, nobody else can see it. But slowly when it comes out into the world, and then goes out into the world, it becomes so much, so many other people get involved, you know, they start sharing your vision and it becomes so much bigger than yourself. So I think it's just a matter of if somebody would like to become entrepreneur, and I think there are everyday entrepreneurs who don't necessarily have to, or have a company, they don't necessarily have to have, um, uh, you know, go solo or, you know, have their own startups, raise venture capital. I think entrepreneurs are whoever are willing to step up. I think in, in there's this book of, you know, called, I think if I'm not mistaken, the name is Daring Greatly by Brittany Brown. And she, she, she tells it really well, where you are kind of into the arena, where you're willing to go into the arena and you know face off your challenges. So that thought process, I would think, is more about becoming an entrepreneur than anything else. So if I think you are ready to take on responsibility, take, ready to learn new things, that mindset is what you know, people need to bring in. What excites you about going to work every day? Oh, that's, that's a really nice question. <laughs> I think, I think you know, what really excites me is that I have the tool to make a difference, that I can you know, structure my day in such a way and build things that at some day will you know, probably you know, touch somebody's life with, and especially probably will touch with somebody's life even when you know, I don't know about it. So that's why I you know, often love hearing about uh, you know, Converge Hub from users when users reach out to me saying, you know, how do I solve this problem? Or, hey, I used it, you know, in this particular case and it worked. Or even saying that, you know, if you just improve this thing a little bit, it will help do this. So it's just kind of, you know, people have taken something that you know, we visual, visualized, which was this small, and they are using it in their own, doing their own thing, which is completely different from what we visualize, and it still works. So that's really exciting, you know, how I'm able to touch people's life and improve their life, if you will, in whatever little way. You know, a lot of people say, well, it's all about making money. We got to be more we're successful because we make more money. But I'm not hearing you say that's the biggest priority. It 
it's really never been that really. It's never been that because if so, I would probably go out. I'm here in the Silicon Valley. We started our company pretty early in the day, would have gone out, raised a lot of capital, you know, gone I the IPO route and you know, done that, you know, made a lot of money. But it's a little more you know, complex than that to me. So I would like to you know, go in my own pace, do my own thing, you know, make my own you know, mark in the world. You mentioned Brene Brown and, and her book. Have you thought about writing a book? I actually have, yes. Ah. So <laughs> I have uh, yeah, thought about it a lot of times, haven't you know, found the time yet, but someday I'm going to write a book. You have a lot of insights that I think people would like to hear, which is one of the reasons I thought it would be great to have you on this podcast. But you do have a lot of insights that I think would inspire people and motivate people and the lessons that you have learned um, and the things that you teach to your employees and your customers are all valuable insights that I would think would make a fascinating book. And of course, um, I have written uh, uh, two books and working on our third now talking about fear, but I am a firm believer in, in something that you said, which is it's all about telling stories too. Um, so it isn't just preaching at people, it's, it's using stories to illustrate what you talk about. And you've, done, uh, you've told a number of those stories in what we're doing here, which I think is great because it really shows in real life examples what's happening. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. I really, really appreciate it. That, you know, I'm, I'm so thankful you said that because it's been on my mind for a long time. I would love to share my experiences in a book. I love writing too. So it's, it's, it's one of my passions. And if I find the time, when I find the time, I do have a blog though. So um, I, I write very short blogs, whatever I can manage, uh, but someday, hopefully I'll be able to sit down and, you know, yeah, narrate these experiences. And do you do videos or any other ways of, of communicating with people outside? I recently started doing that. I actually, yesterday I put out my first uh, video on LinkedIn and I'm planning to do that more and more because what I'm seeing is uh, that's another really another different medium for you know, somebody who is not that fond of reading to still be able to go out and uh, yeah, you know, put your ideas forward in front of that person. So I, I your, intend to do that more and more. What was your first video about? Entrepreneurship. <laughs> oh, of course, so I was <laughs> actually talking about what it means to be an entrepreneur, believe it or not. So that was one topic very fresh on my mind when I started talking about it today. Well, and it makes makes perfect sense. And again, I think as you work toward a book, and you you can always get people to to help do some of the writing of it just to to save time um, or free up some of yours, but. Yes. Um, in in the books that I've written, I've worked with two writers, and I'm working with a third uh, professional writer in the book that we're writing now. Um, the working title of it is "A Guide Dog's Guide to Being Brave," because we're talking about controlling fear, which is, of course, what happened to me on September 11th, being in the World Trade Center and escaping. It was all about for me. Um, be, knowing in advance what to do in the case of an emergency and being as prepared as one could be, which kept the fear away. Um, and, yeah, I was certainly always concerned about what might happen while we were going down the stairs because there was fire above us. We had no idea it was an airplane or anything that hit the building at the time. None of us did. It wasn't a blindness issue, but clearly something was very seriously wrong. And uh, at the same time, the preparation that I had made in advance was very helpful. And so we finally decided during the pandemic to write about that. And so I'm um, working with a writer, Carrie Wyatt Kent, and we're putting the book together. And what I find is that she does a lot of the writing. Um, I do a lot of the writing, but I also, because we want to put it in, in my story, even then take what she writes and, and tweak it some, but it's still a whole lot less time right. than if, if I did it all. So it's another, another way to go. But for me, it, it does help to get the message out there to put it in a book form and people have appreciated what we've written so far. So I guess it's a good thing. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And your story is is so, so inspiring. I've read about it in your uh, website. I do plan to you know, get your book and read all about it you know, in more detail. But, you know, what you went through and how, you know, with your dog, it's it's very, very inspiring story. Yeah, what people often miss is that, that it's a team effort. The dog has a job to do and I have a job to do that. The dog doesn't lead, the dog guides. And there's a big distinct difference between those two. Um, but Thunder Dog is the title of the book and it it is out there. And I think that it helps to teach people a lot about what blindness is really like as opposed to what we think it is. And it's the usual myth that people have misconceptions, whether it's about blindness or technology or whatever. Um, it is all about education and getting people to to move forward and recognize that maybe we have the wrong idea about what this is about. Yeah, yeah, I, I absolutely am going to uh, you know, read your book. And uh, do you know when uh, your new book is coming out? Did you set a date yet? The tentative date is by the time all is done, we get it edited and everything else is going to, it's, it's away, away as away yet, probably in the um, first or, well, probably in the second quarter of 2024. So it's not going to be soon. It's been a while. Yeah, it's going to be a while, but I'm looking forward to it already. Definitely going to read that one too. Well, we were blessed to get a contract signed with a publisher. And so um, we're working with their time frame. We've we've talked about when to publish it and why to publish it then. So I think it'll be kind of fun. But we at this point there's Thunderdog and Running with Roselle. So definitely get them and running yeah. and Thund- Thunderdog especially is also available in audio format, which is um, an easy way to get it if you do much driving. Yeah, yeah, sure. Even I'm, in an autonomous vehicle. I yeah, I need an autonomous vehicle for that. But I just love reading, so I'm definitely going to get that. And your book was a, a bestseller too, right? Yeah, it was the number one New York Times bestseller. Again, we wow. were very blessed with that. So that's impressive. We like that. Well, Shampa, I'm going to let you go back to doing some of the creative things that you do. We've been talking for an hour, and it's been fun. Really, it's um, been an hour already. <laughs> I know, isn't that fun? <laughs> yeah, and you it, it are was welcome. So much fun. You are welcome to come back anytime if you want to talk further. I would love to do that, and definitely, I want to stay in touch. I love what you had to say about artificial intelligence and so on, and um, and I'm glad that you did check out Accessibility. We talked about that very bri- briefly. It's it's also a bleeding edge type of technology. It is. It is. Yes. It was. I was very impressed with it. I did take a look at it, and I look forward to talking to them again. But we'll help facilitate that. And um, and any time that we can be of help, uh, and if you want to talk more to folks here, don't hesitate. Um, we can even use some of these to podcasts to help with your book. Oh, yeah, that would be wonderful. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you for that idea. It's It's been a pleasure talking to you. It's been a lot well, of fun. I've enjoyed it very much. And I hope all of you who are listening have enjoyed it. Wherever you are, hope that you enjoyed the last hour. If you would like, I want to hear from you. Um, But before I give you my contact information, Shampa, how can people find you and maybe learn more about what you're doing and about uh, Converge Hub and so on? Yeah, I have a blog. I write pretty regularly in there. So you could uh, read my blog. It's uh, thespark.work. So thespark, one word, dot W-O-R-K. Thespark, T-H-E-S-P-A-R-K. T-H-E. S-P-A-R-K dot work. Dot work. Right. Yes. Okay. And you could follow me on LinkedIn. You know, I'm very active there. And also my uh, email address is Shampa, S-H-A-M-P-A at ConvergeHub.com. So any of these methods work, just, just reach out to me. And we are all going to be anxiously awaiting your book someday. Thank you for your encouragement, Michael. <laughs> now I have to write a book. <laughs> There you go. Well, again, wherever you are, thanks for listening. If you'd like to reach out and talk about today's podcast, I would love to hear from you. You can reach me at Michael H-I, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-H-I at accessibee.com. Accessibee is spelled A-C-C-E-S-S-I-B-E.com. Or you can go to our podcast page, www.michaelhingson. M-I-C-H-A-E-L-H-I-N-G-S-O-N dot com slash podcast. And by the way, since we mentioned Accessibility, you can even see Accessibility on the site and learn more about it. Also, 
I would definitely appreciate you giving us a five-star rating when you finish today. Please rate the podcast. I hope that you found it enjoyable and interesting and that you will give it a five-star rating. So thanks for listening. And Shapa, again, thank you very much for being here today. Thank you, Michael. It was wonderful talking to you. Thanks very much.